What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, if you could see, I'm here with Christina Nicholson, who I'm going to properly introduce in a second. And Christina, I was thinking of a, a few past episodes that were good that people should check out. And, um, you know, our some of our friends who are other uh, agency owners, uh, Joey Gilkey, you should check out him. Jason Swank, you should check out him. Ian Garlic, I was actually... Uh, I love his podcast, so check out Ian Garlic's uh, Garlic Marketing Show, and Christina was on there as well. And before I introduce Christina, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, and I co-founded the Rise25 with, with my business partner, John Corcoran. And Christina, when I'm thinking about you know, my um, network in my business, I'm always thinking of ways to give to my best relationships, and I've seen over the past you know, over decade, no better way than to have a podcast. It's allowed me to profile some of my favorite people, the people I respect and I love and admire and want them to share their thought leadership with the world. So um, that's what we do actually at Rise25. We are an easy button. We help you launch and run your podcast so it makes sense for your business. So if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and uh, learn more and contact us. Uh, I am excited for today's guest, uh, Christina Nicholson, um, you know, a pretty amazing journey when I did the research and she's founder of Media Maven and also founder of the software Podcast Clout. And she's an award-winning journalist with more than a decade of experience. She's done anywhere from anchoring, writing, blogging, video production, everything. And she's been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, The Huffington Post, Time, yeah, all over the place, media outlets she could be seen on TV. Um, more importantly, Christina, it's like you've gotten your clients everywhere and anywhere, um, the Today Show and, and all sorts of mainstream media. But you talk about some of the you know, niche media uh, is even better. So people can check you out at MediaMavenAndMore.com and they can check out Podcast Cloud. So thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. Excited to chat I have to you. show you here, right here. And um, if people don't <laughs> know, um, there's podcast cloud as well. And so we'll talk about that. But, you know, I, I wrote on the title of this is fake news and how to mm -hmm. get on the Today Show. So you did an amazing talk, uh, TED talk about fake news. And you saw this firsthand. What, what were you referring to? And, and how is it? How do you see it relevant today? Yeah. So the full title was fake news. It's your fault. You hear everybody talking about fake news and they blame the media, which can we stop saying the media? Like right now, if you are on social media, you are part of the media. So like stop with the media that that is it's you, you just can't do that anymore. Um, but basically, fake news being your fault, it's just people getting online and believing whatever they want and sharing it. And that's how news spreads, whether or not it's real or not. A lot of people, even today, when we talk about mainstream media and they watch TV, sometimes they're watching opinion shows, they're watching talk shows, and they don't take the time to actually think about what they're watching. And they say, oh, this person said this, that's not true, that's a lie. And they go on a tangent about it, but it's like, well, you were watching a talk show, you were watching somebody share their opinion, you weren't watching an actual news broadcast. And then you look at, People will consume things and they will comment on things and they will engage th with things. And sometimes they hate what they're watching and they'll leave negative comments and they will share it and say something terrible about it. But that only fuels the fire, meaning you're going to see more of it. An example that I shared in my TED talk was the Kardashians. If you see any story about any one of those ladies and you look at the comments section, 99% of what you're going to see is negativity. But those people that are posting those stories, those news outlets, they're going to go on their back end and they're going to look at their insights and they're going to say, oh, wow, this story about Chloe organizing her garage, that got a whole bunch of engagement. So let's show more of Chloe. Let's show more of her sisters. That's because you're engaging with it. I would see every day in the newsroom, we would go into, into work and we would see the ratings from the night before. 
And it proved to us that people liked watching those negative stories. They liked the shootings and all of the bad things happening on local TV because when we would switch to a positive story, they would change the channel. So it's mm. your actions that are determining what you are seeing. And that's that just speaks to how you should react to the news. If you don't like it, then don't engage with it. And you need to also remember, I feel like sometimes I'm talking to my boomer parents, like, let me explain to you how easy it is for anybody to put anything on the internet. It's super easy and it doesn't always mean it's true. Like people will see memes and they will think these memes are true. <laughs> like Bernie because it, Sanders. <laughs> yeah, like did you know Bernie was skiing on a mountain? No, he wasn't. <laughs> like you, you have to consider what you're looking at, consider the source. Is it fact or is it fiction? And a lot of times, People, I mean, let's let's be honest, people don't care. They they sometimes know it's not fact, but because it coincides with their personal belief, they're gonna share it and pretend it's fact and they're gonna use that as an argument. So that is why fake news is your fault. That kind of yeah. sums up the TEDx talk. <laughs> yeah. And and I encourage people to check it out because you tell a story of your friend who this yeah. like totally impacted their life in that. So check out her TEDx talk about it. And we will talk about going you fielding tons of pitches to now mm -hmm. making it a better there's a better way um in public relations to get on channels and get on different sources and we'll talk about that but i'd love to hear an example christina you mentioned cuz it did strike me when i when when you said okay people watch negative and if mm -hmm when you were publishing positive stuff, it didn't get the views. So what is that gonna fuel for the media to keep pr putting out negative things? I'm wondering what was something that was a positive news story that you remember, and maybe you were one of the anchors on it, maybe it was just something you you saw at the station that you thought was gonna do amazing. And it just flopped because it was positive. Do you remember any of those stories that like, oh, this is a feel good story. Everyone's going to love it. Everyone's going to view it. And then it just, no one engaged with it. And so. Yeah. I, rem I remember pitching a lot of stories that were more positive. They call them like fluff stories. Mm -hmm. And I remember pitching a lot of them. And basically we just weren't allowed to do them because there were other things happening and they were more more hard news than soft news. So we just didn't get a lot of opportunity to do it. The mm. only time we really would was when, you know, the last TV market I worked at was the NBC station in the Miami Fort Lauderdale area. That's when LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh were playing for the Heat. So we did some stories, you know, like I remember they would go to a hospital and they would hand mm. out toys, you know, to kids at the hospital around Christmas. Um Things like that. Uh, Dwayne Wade, I remember I did a story with him helping to rehabilitate a house for a family in need. Those stories did okay, but if they didn't have the the big celebrity basketball players behind them, we probably would not have done them. They mm. just added they just added that level of newsworthiness because of the people involved. And it's unfortunate, but at the end of the day, Every news agency is a business. They have to get ratings. And if it is shown that that us doing positive news stories don't bring in ratings, we're going to stop doing positive news stories. And it kind of frustrates me when everybody says, oh, the news is so negative. I wish they did more positive stories. Well, we try. And when we do, you don't watch them. And when we do the negative ones, you watch those. So right. like we, if we did all positive stories all the time, we wouldn't be in business because we wouldn't have advertisers to pay for the production of everything because you're not watching. So it, again, with the positive news stories, I have a client um, called Midas Project Spark. And it's a it's a part of Midas, the, the tire and the, the car company. And they give away cars to people in need. And they actually, we started getting a little bit more traction for them during the pandemic because people were looking for those feel good stories. And, you know, there were stories of people losing jobs or losing their cars. So they would be gifted a car. So that is an example of, I think when it worked and that was just, again, a reflection of, of the news cycle, what was happening in the world, what was happening in the country. So again, 
I'm sure we'll discuss it throughout our chat today, but it all goes back to making it newsworthy. You know, like I mentioned with those basketball players, they made it newsworthy with giving away cars. The pandemic made it a little bit more newsworthy because people were looking for those more positive stories and, and show of support. Let's talk about that. So there's a bracelet company. Um, yes. Tell me about them and about making them newsworthy. Yeah. So Little Words Project, These, this is what uh, their product looks like. They're um, one word bracelets. Like you can think of any any word. It can be custom or it can be something, um, you know, that's generic, like breathe, believe, be happy. And we actually started working with this company before the pandemic. We're still working with them now. And the owner created this idea when she was in college in her dorm room. And she's uh, built it up to a team of all women out of New Jersey. They, they call themselves the Nice Girl Gang. And she just wanted to build her business. She wanted more awareness, like tell more people about, about these bracelets and focus on women. And, and I want to tell my story of a founder. So the biggest mistake people make when they pitch the media, and I saw this all the time as a TV reporter, is people will send out a press release which that worked great in the 70s. But let me tell you, today does not work <laughs> as well. People still do it because they're just stuck in, in, in the times of, of when they learned this, but that is not how it works anymore. Um, and they'll just say, this is my company and this is what we do. And this is what you should tell everybody about it. And it's like, that's not news. That's like a free commercial and it's not exciting. It has nothing to do with news. So what we do to get a client like Little Words Project coverage is we look at the product itself and we get it in a lot of roundups. So best gifts for Mother's Day, Valentine's Day is coming up, best gifts uh, for, for the woman in your life for Valentine's Day. And then you look at those even more niche awareness days, you know, like National Best Friends Day, National like Secretary's Day. Day or something. Exactly. Yeah. Because somebody is always doing a story about those days. People are looking for content, especially online. I mean, a lot of these, these news agencies, these media outlets, these blogs, they can't pump the content out fast enough. So the secret to getting products coverage is to look for those roundups and make it relevant. And then we also get her coverage. She is a Hispanic female business owner. So right away, we're targeting people who write about Hispanics. We're talking about, we're targeting people who write about women. We're targeting people who write about business owners. And she tells her story. We got her in Forbes talking about how she was bullied when she was in high school and she was in college. So she created these bracelets so she could look down and see a positive message. And it has a, a little registration code. So you can give it to somebody and you can kind of track who's had it and how it's helped them. So she talks about just her entrepreneurial story. And regardless of what you do, whether you have a product, whether you have a service, in addition to earning coverage to promote that, you also need to earn coverage to promote yourself. You always need to be building your personal brand because that's who people want to do business with. So we look at those two things, like what is the main offering and then what is their story? How can we promote them? And sometimes people come to us because they just want to build their personal brand because they know that by doing that, they will get more speaking gigs or more book sales or you know whatever their end goal is. Yeah, it sounds like... Christina, one of your superpowers of you and the company is drawing out those stories because, you know, the product is one thing, but when you, you know, find out this person was bullied and their background and they have certain stories and, and then maybe I imagine things that they don't even consider a story or even consider that interesting because it's just maybe what they lived. And when you draw that out, I could see so many angles on that because there's so many uh, things that come out on bullying. What's another uh, client that you had that when you're talking to them that you just discovered this amazing story that it's not even something that they they led with or thought was amazing until you kind of drew it out of them? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it helps also that I've been on the other side. I worked as a TV reporter and anchor for 10 years. So I was getting all of those emails and all those press releases and deleting 99% of them. So I knew what a good pitch was. I knew what people in a newsroom were looking for when I started my business. And another example I could give you, this was when I first started. I didn't even have an agency. I called myself a professional freelancer. I was looking for work on LinkedIn and Upwork. And that's how I got started. I did that for almost two years. And I had a couple of guys come to me 
they started a fitness app. So like Jeremy, if you're in Texas and I'm in Florida and we wanted to race each other or something, we could do this like virtually on an app. Like we were like running side by side. And one of the guys had a crazy fitness story. He was 400 pounds and lost half his body weight through exercising. Wow. And then the other founder was a personal trainer. And they said, you know, we hired this PR agency and nothing's happening. And we're just looking for some help. And I said, well, let me see what this person's doing. Like, let me just see why it's not working. And this person was creating press releases just saying, this is the new app. And this is what it does. And this is what you should tell people about it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, how many apps are out there? How many fitness apps are out there? A new app is not news. So in three months, we ended up getting these two guys coverage. They were from Washington, D.C. So we got them on TV in Washington, D.C., which is a top 10 TV market. We got them in the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Today Show. Um, we got them in women's running, in men's fitness, a variety of places in just three months. And that was because we focused on one the founder's expertise as a personal trainer. So whenever anybody had any questions as it related to working out, exercising, cardio, we got him quoted. And when he was quoted, it was his name and it was the co-founder of this business. So yes, we're not talking about the business in the whole article. And that's, again, the mistake people make. They think that's what they're gonna get They that because that's what they want. But nobody's going to give you that. You have to be happy with just being quoted and getting that title and getting that backlink to your website because that's how it's going to happen. And little by little, it all builds up. So we got him coverage just sharing his expertise, building his personal brand. And by the way, he also co-founded this company. Go check it out. And then the other guy, we got him coverage for his story. He lost half his body weight through running. So he created this running app to help other people. And when you lead with his story and what he did to help other people, that's how that running app earned coverage. We didn't lead with the app because a new app is not news. And the problem a lot of people have is they're so connected and invested in their service or their product that they think it's news because they think it's the best thing anybody's ever seen. And there's nothing else like it it's still not news. <laughs> you have to have some kind of story that's not just going to educate people, but it's going to entertain them and it has to have some kind of emotion. So we just kind of changed the angle. And when we pitched, we didn't make it about the app. We made it about the personal trainer's expertise. We made it about this guy's story and what he did with his story and his weight loss and how he's helping other people. And then by default, the app comes into conversation and the app will get promoted. The problem is people are impatient and they don't want to wait that long and they don't want the little one sentence mention. They want the full page mention and it's just not going to happen. So they get frustrated and they give up. But if you just do a little bit here and there, it will start to snowball with with that client specifically. They got on the Today Show because a producer at the Today Show saw their story in the Washington Post. They get in the Washington Post because they did local TV in Washington, D.C. They did local TV in Washington, D.C. because we pitched a writer there and we came up with different angles at different times to make it newsworthy. So you have to be patient. You have to really just help members of the media and journalists do their job. If you can just give them what they want and what they need on a silver platter and help them do their job, you will get the publicity and you will get the promotion. You just have to pump the brakes a little bit because that's just how the industry works. Yeah. No, I love the way you backtrack that to the the origin, the source, right? Where it started. It doesn't start off. People see it on the Today Show, but they don't see you got this one writer to write this one paragraph thing and it, it you know, actually snowballs from there. I'd love for you to talk about because I love your viewpoint on niching. And today show versus maybe a specific running magazine. So can you talk about that? Yeah. yeah. So these guys, they got on the today show, which is great. Everybody knows that it's amazing for credibility. I mean, you could turn that video clip and you could turn it into an advertisement on Facebook and target runners. Like it's huge for credibility and authority, but there's a lot of people who watch the today show 
who will only run if they are being chased by the killer. So <laughs> you need to get them in front of their audience. So you do see the profit from the publicity and their number one goal the whole entire time we started working together was runner's world because that is their audience. And we started pitching runner's world when we started working together. I think it was in October or August. It was in the fall. And magazines work three months ahead of time. So for example, in August, you know, they're already getting ready to get their December issue out there. So that's just one thing to keep in mind if you are pitching print magazines. Um, so we were pitching Runner's World. And after about a month, your pitch should be stale. Because again, remember, you have to be newsworthy. If it's something that can stand on its own year round, it's not newsworthy. So you have to come up with different pitches at different times. And it took a few months of pitching different people at Runner's World with different angles, but we did get them in there. It took almost a year, but it happened. And that was their number one audience. And I mean, I guess you could say it took nine months because again, they're three months ahead of schedule. But yeah, we got them in Runner's World. And it's even though it sounds less impressive than the Today Show, it was their goal because they were focused on the bigger picture, which were those download numbers and those revenue numbers. A lot of people get really um, tied up in the pomp and circumstance and the limelight of it all because they wanna say, I've been here, I've been here, I've been here. Again, great for credibility, but when it comes down to direct ROI, it may not be as helpful. Does it help in some ways? Yes. But different media does different things. You know, like online media is great for SEO because you get all of those backlinks in all those different places. TV is great for credibility. I think podcasts are great for quick ROI just because the mindset of a podcast listener is so different than somebody who's scrolling online or flipping through the TV channel. So you just have to keep the different forms of media in mind as well when you're pitching. You know, I love what you said when you were talking to Ian. Christina, and you said, would you rather look cool or make money, right? The Today Show, you can look cool. And that's there's a time and a place for that. But Runner's World is what's going to have them make money, it sounds like. Yeah, and it's different yeah. for everybody. Like, for example, Little Words Project got them on the Today Show. And for the next week, they were selling hundreds and hundreds of these bracelets. But again, the Today Show, most people watching that are middle-aged women. They're going to like the bracelets. Yeah. So what works for you may not work for somebody else. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about what's a good, what's in a good pitch. What was one of the best, I'd love to hear one of the best pitches you received um, when you were, you know, in the media and now when you're pitching the media, but what was, do you remember one of the best pitches you received? Yeah. I mean, I could tell you, I can give and you what one. what was in it? Yeah. I can give you one specific example, but generally the best ones are five sentences and they just tell me what the story is, why I should care, and are they gonna give me everything I need to do it? There, there, I mean, I got pitches where people would send an idea and I'll email them back. I'm like, okay, great, let's do it. And they'll say, okay, well, we'll be ready next week. And it's like, no, I came into work at nine this morning. I need to put something on the air at 5 p.m. Like we need to go now. And they would say, oh, we're not ready. We need to prepare. Well, nope, then lost opportunity on to the next. You need to keep the, the pitch short. So the best pitches are definitely short. Press releases don't get open. Even if you put if you put press release in the title, like in the subject line, you're gonna get deleted before you're even opened. Nobody has time for that. People in newsrooms, even podcasters, I mean, you know this, Jeremy, like anybody who has any kind of platform where they give attention to anybody else, they get hundreds, if not thousands of emails a day. Nobody has time to read more than two or three sentences. So you need to grab my attention quickly with the subject line. You need to keep it short, sweet, and to the point, and you need to give me what I need. You know, like give me talking points, give me video, give me pictures, like help me do my job because not only will that increase your chances of coverage, but it will also, it'll also make it easier for me to work with you now and in the future. And in addition to that, this is something that everybody misses. I think 99% of people miss. But if you pitch me and you tell me that you will share it on social media, you will share it with your audience, you just went to the top of my list. Because so many people, they earn the media exposure and they're like, oh, great, I got the exposure, thanks, bye. That is the, you are leaving so much money on the table when you do that. 
I can tell you from myself and for clients that when you share that media exposure on social media, you tag the media outlet, you tag the journalist, not only does it live longer, but your audience sees that and they see that as you being credible, you being an authority in your space. And that is what turns the publicity into profit. Don't assume everybody saw it. Assume nobody saw it. Because even if they did see it, two minutes later, they're going to forget because they're on to the next. So the best pitches have a short and sweet subject line, a short and sweet email. So I know exactly what I'm getting and what you're going to give me. And you're going to tell me you're going to share it. I've had clients who have lost coverage because they have said, well, last time we did a story, your client didn't share it on their social media and their competitor did. So we're going to go to their competitor again. And then I will tell you to give you a specific example of a pitch I got for somebody to be on my podcast, Become a Media Maven. And it was a great pitch. Um, this this woman... That, that means a lot coming from you also. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't end well. Okay. I'll tell you. That, that's good. So Go <laughs> the pitch was great because it was like, here, she can come on. These are the talking points. And they were very specific. Don't pitch and say, I can talk about entrepreneurship. I can talk about marketing. So can thousands of other people. Like what is specific that I've never talked about before. That that is going to set you apart. So great talking points got her on the schedule. And then whoever, I don't know if it was a publicist, a booking agency, I don't know who it was, kept emailing after it was scheduled, but before we recorded the interview to talk about her book is coming out this time. So let's make sure we say that. Next email. Her book is coming out at this time. So can you release your episode right before this? Next email. I want to make sure her book gets publicity. And we talked, and then I canceled the interview. I was like, listen, this is not a book promotion podcast. And I canceled the interview. But the, the thing is, she could have come on and she could have shared all of her amazing talking yeah. points. And she could have said, I go into this more in my book. It's titled This. It comes out this day. That's it. And then at the end of the podcast, I would have said, Where can people buy your book? Where can we find out more about you? But because in the pitching process, I was being treated like it was my job and my obligation to promote this stranger's book, I just canceled the thing. So again, with the pitch, stop thinking about yourself. Just think of how you can help this person on the other end do their job. And I promise you, the promotion will come naturally. It happens by default. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, Christina, what does any new source podcast want they want a good story and they want more audience so if you give it to them on a silver platter um then that's exactly what they want right and, and it's 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 actually funny you say that because you know about sharing it. it seems so simple but i i am kind of baffled by it too when i have someone on and I'm like, it's going to benefit you. We basically talked about you for 60 minutes <laughs> and how cool you are and, and your advice that's valuable. So I've just found myself being really explicit. By the way, when you share it and you comment on or like it, we make it easy. We post it on LinkedIn and you all you have to do is share it or you know, like it. Your people, your audience, your followers and friends are going to see it. Just share it. And they're going to hear about what you do. It's, it's, it's super un simple. It's unbelievable how yeah. simple and obvious it is. And people don't do it. And yeah. it's almost like people are just using you to get the publicity to your audience. And then they dip out. And yeah. honest to God, they're leaving so much money on the table. I wrote for Inc. Magazine for two years. And whenever anybody reached out to me because of an article in Inc., it wasn't directly from the article. It was usually on LinkedIn or Twitter because I tweeted it or I shared it. And I said, read this article that I wrote in Inc. about this. Mm -hmm. That's when people connected to me. And it's shocking how lazy and selfish people are when they earn media exposure. I mean, I honestly think that's what it is. I think people today, they're impatient, they're lazy, and they're selfish. And there's always a what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And and the funny thing is, is that there's so much more in it for you if you would share. <laughs> And we make it so easy for you to share this stuff. But I mean, it's, it's, it blows, it blows my mind. Yeah. I think, you know, I think sometimes people are so busy. They don't even think like, oh, cool. They don't even think that that's something they should do. And so yeah. I found when I say it, 
the light bulb goes, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's like they didn't think of it, which okay, cool. Like that's they're we're busy, we're all busy. So if you are on someone else's show or you're on another outlet, share it. You know, they'll love you for it, but also will benefit you because you're sharing your message. So I, I think it's so rude when people don't, honestly. That's why I always try to tag people. Sometimes they're hard to find, like Jeremy, you on Instagram. You were hard <laughs> to find for me about half hour ago. But I mean, I always try to tag the people say so they know, like, look, I'm sharing this. I'm grateful. Like, thank you for taking the time for me to share my knowledge with your audience. That's an amazing opportunity. What's Christina? So you've you received lots of pitches. What is one of your most proud moments pitches that you sent out you had all oh, the okay. ducks in a row and you know like it it just all worked exactly how you knew it should work yeah well i actually share the pitch with anybody who wants it you can get it at podcastclout.com slash pat and this is one of my first pitches that i shared or that i sent as a new business owner I was a professional freelancer at the time and trying to build an online business and, you know, doing the whole thing that everybody on the internet tells you is super easy to do, but in real life, it's not. Um, so I sent a pitch to Pat Flynn and it wasn't an email pitch. I mean, yes, I did email, but it was only, it was only two, two words uh, or two sentences. And it was, I made a video for you. So watch it because you said you never get pitched by video. So here's a video pitch. And that was because I heard him on a podcast say he gets 400 emails a day. And granted, this was four years ago. So like, imagine what it is now. Saying he gets 400 emails a day, people wanting to be on his podcast, but nobody ever sends him a video. And if somebody sent him a video, he would watch it. So I was like, okay, here's a video, watch it. And it was two minutes long. And it was basically like, I should be on your podcast. And this is why, and this is, a, this is how I could help your audience. So I sent it. A couple weeks later, uh, I didn't hear anything. And I, it was like uh, on YouTube, I sent him a private link on YouTube and there was only one view on it. And I knew that was me just making sure it worked. And so I, I sent a follow-up and it was the follow-up where I got booked. And that booking was like a couple months later, I recorded the episode and then it didn't come out for a few months later after that. So I, I kind of walk, walk you through the process. And um, again, that's at podcastclout.com slash Pat. I walk you through the entire process of what happened from start to finish. And from that first episode, um, not only did I get, you know, uh, customers into my online course, but that led to me being accepted into his, his mastermind that he started a couple of years ago. And then after that, I was on his podcast a second time, which led to more clients for my agency, Media Maven. And I can literally track just being on his, I mean, that you can see the picture there. He invited me on stage to speak at podcast movement um, last year. So just that one first pitch that I sent as a professional freelancer, it led to so much. Um, so I think that's the one I'm probably most proud of because it was one of the first podcasts I was on as a guest. It was years before I started my podcast. And um, it made a big, a big difference in my life, not only just with like, like the revenue that came in, but but getting into his mastermind and meeting the other people in his mastermind. I mean, Jeremy, I know you from Jason Swank. I found out about Jason Swank from Pat. Hmm. And if I didn't pitch him all those years ago, I probably I wouldn't be here right now with you. You know, like it's just the way things happen and how you meet people and learn about people. So talk about Podcast Club. So podcast cloud, okay, let me just be clear. I don't know anything about software. I don't know anything about technology. I am not somebody who was like, ooh, let me create software. No. How it came about was in PR, there are these softwares that exist for you to find, you know, anybody in TV and print online. So say you want to pitch Oprah Magazine. You can go into these softwares and you can type in Oprah Magazine. You'll get all of the information for everybody who works there, every department, their email, their phone number, everything. But nothing like this existed for podcasts. And I learned, as you just heard, you can really change your business by being a guest on podcasts. And I was pitching podcasts for myself and for clients, but I was literally picking up my phone and just scrolling through the podcast app. 
like, oh, this looks good. This looks good. Let me go online and do my research and find out who to pitch and how to pitch them and more information. Like it was time consuming. So basically podcast clout just automates all of that for you. And we're very selective because again, this is built from a PR perspective. I don't want to book my clients on a podcast that nobody listens to because then they're going to spend 30 minutes to an hour talking to somebody and they're going to come back to me and be like, well, that was a waste of time. Nobody listens to it. So podcast clout does not include the million plus podcasts that are out there. It only includes right now the numbers at about 20,000. And we look at what is ranking at the top of every category in Apple Podcasts. They have about 100 categories. You know, you have entrepreneurship, marketing, nonprofit, um, all kinds of categories, over 100 of them. And we look at the top 200 podcasts in each category every day. And we put all of the information you need to pitch to be a guest in there. Now, we don't pitch for you. We don't do what you do, Jeremy, where we help people start and grow their own podcast. This was created for people like me, for people in the PR industry who need to pitch their, their clients to be guests on podcasts, but they're tired of spending hours on the admin work and they just want to build custom pitch lists. You can do it based on keyword. You can do category. You can put them together um, to, to really niche down. And, um, you know, we see some podcast booking agencies use it, some speakers, some authors, people who act as their own publicist and want to get on more podcasts. So, that's that's how it was created. I started working with business coaches on this because again, I know nothing about software or technology. So I build a team around me of people who know a lot more than me. This was just something that came about like I saw a big hole in the market and a need for it. And I think, um, Jeremy, you, I mean, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I think people are are not understanding or maybe they're just not educated yet on podcasts because they are newer and a lot of people just don't understand the value in them i mean we know people spend billions and billions of dollars advertising on podcasts but i think a lot of people in marketing and in business they they still don't really don't really get it so i think maybe that's why development on tools like this for podcasts specifically have been a little a little slow coming yeah exactly i think you know there is, I see a big need for this and, and people should check out podcast cloud. And also I could definitely see some of the, um, the podcast booking agencies out there using it to make it easier. And, and it serves the podcast community too, because then you're getting relevant guests on to relevant shows and it really helps both parties because really is a, a podcast, you're looking for just relevant guests to what you're focused in on. And when you get those, like you said, those nicely crafted pitches, it's a win for the host, right? It just makes our job easier. And so I'm sure, you know, people like Tom Schwab know about your software. If not, Tom, check out Podcast Cloud. Um, and, um, but yeah, there's there's a big need on both sides that will help. And I'd love to hear, first of all, um, thank you, Christina, for sharing your knowledge. Um, you've been on both sides of the pitching, being pitched and, um, you know, crafting good pitches so that are newsworthy really. And um, I want to point people to your website, which we talked about on um, podcastcloud.com, mediamaven and more.com. Um, who, who are ideal clients for you? Who should be calling you, emailing you to work with you? Yeah. Well, I already discussed podcast cloud. So I'll go on to media maven, media maven. It's a, it's a PR agency. We do everything for you. So our retainers start at $4,500 a month, and that's for local niche outreach. And then they go up from there. Um, so again, if you want, you know, like all media outlets or you want national coverage, you're going to pay at least $6,500 a month. And that's pretty average. A lot of people reach out to me and they're like, oh, I want PR, but I don't have that budget. So then I created an online course that's under a thousand bucks. If you want some help while you execute it, if you want me to build you those media lists, if you want me to look over pitches, if you want to speak with people on my team, then we charge, um, it's a six month program. It's very much done with you instead of do it yourself. That's um, just under $5,000 over a six month period. And we've had a lot of great success. I can, for people watching live, I can scooch out of the way. I have um, a little no a thank you note from somebody here and she included her her TV hits um, that she got while she was in that program. And, you know, we make introductions to the media. If we know somebody and if you have a good pitch, we'll introduce you. 
Um, with that though, you have to you have to do the work. You have to set set up your calls with us. You have to pitch the media. We don't press the buttons for you, but we tell you which buttons to press and where you can find the buttons, and then you got to go press the buttons yourself. So I offer. I mean, I have a few different options, but I will say, it is a time consuming thing pitching the media because you don't just have to pitch everybody specifically, but you have to follow up. And then after a couple of weeks, you have to go back to the drawing board with a new angle to make sure it's newsworthy. So just be mindful of that when you are looking for somebody to help you with PR. Obviously, I have a media background. Most of my team has a media background. I do think it makes a big difference when you reach out to people. So make sure you know, you're know you hiring somebody who, who has experience and they know what they're doing. Especially today, I mean, you know, everybody's everybody's some kind of expert on the internet. Everybody's a business coach, a publicist, a podcast expert, whatever it is. So just make sure you do your homework. I, I share a lot of free resources. Um, I have my, my podcast as well. So I'm definitely an oversharer. I don't hold anything back. So I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions for anybody if they are looking to learn a little bit more about the industry. And we're so everyone could check out media maven and more.com where all of that lives if you want a course to do you know do it for yourself if you want kind of a done with you or a totally you don't want to push any of the buttons you just want her and her team to do it because that's what they specialize in then you can contact them christina thank you so much are there any other places online we should point people towards um, you can find me on social. I am at Christina all day on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so I'm, I'm there every day and I chat back if you chat to me. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Check out more episodes and we'll see you next time. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.